Hello, my front end friends. We already have scope CSS solutions in a lot of popular JavaScript frameworks, but now we actually have scope in native CSS and like a lot of things that come from other places that eventually make it into the vanilla CSS or, you know, regular CSS, things like variables, the new color functions and stuff that we have, and a lot of other awesome things that are coming. The native version is often more powerful than what we got from where, you know, the original tools that it came from. And in my opinion, this new way of scoping things is actually a really intuitive way that also helps us overcome many of the issues that people run into with the cascade in general. So this video is gonna be a bit of a crash course into native CSS scoping. And we're gonna be starting off about why you might even want it in the first place. And we'll dive into some other useful stuff along the way from there uh, of how we can use it and some of the other stuff. So really fast, I just have three articles set up here, nothing too fancy. Uh, and I have a few utility classes that I can use to change the colors of them. So let's say I come here and I do class is equal to light. That's going to get a light theme. Uh, we can do a class is dark on this one. And just we have a third one, we can come and do a class is equal to vibrant, vibrant on that one right there. And so we have my light, my dark, and then my vibrant. Perfect. Uh, we're ready to go and everything's working pretty good. But what about the links and other stuff that's in here? Right now, obviously the colors aren't working too well. So to help with the color of the links here, what we could do is, you know, I could say my light and then I have a light A. Um, obviously my color is the same. I could use an inherit, but let's, you know, they could be different as well, right? Um, so we're gonna do the light A, then I have my dark and I have my dark A that can come in. And then of course there's the vibrant and we can have a vibrant A as well. So we're just styling the links the way we need them to be styled. Now let's come into this dark one that I have right here. And we're gonna come on this middle one. We're to do this is a class is equal to light and this can potentially cause some problems because now if we take a look at it i can't read my link my link is actually white wait why is my <laughs> why is my link white and if we open up our dev tools and we take a look at that the reason that it's the light is because my dark a which has the same specificity as the light a is overwriting it because you know this is both you know this link that's right here is both a link that's inside of dark and inside of light and because the dark one has the same specificity, but it's coming after the one that's here, this one is winning and oh, that sucks. And we can make this even worse by like mucking around with our buttons and breaking all of our buttons and other stuff along the way here. So I've just updated um, things a little bit. So you can see on my buttons, I have a button dark and a button light, and we're doing a lot of the same stuff and we're just running into problems across the board here. And you might be saying, well, Kevin, just don't do this then, right? Don't do not do the descendant selectors with your light A and your dark A and your vibrant A and things like that because they're just causing problems and there's other ways we could write our CSS that overcomes this and we don't have to worry about it. And yes, you would be right. And this has always been one of those things that's been with CSS. We sort of altered our way and we write code in very specific ways with our selectors and you know, one selector for everything, avoid descendant selectors and things like that. Uh, because there's you know potential foot guns along the way if you don't think about these things ahead of time and then you end up doing something like this then you have to refactor then the next project you know anyway you you've probably run into this at least once and you got annoyed by it scope solves this problem because now we don't have to worry about things like this happening if we set up our scope properly and then that's going to run us into an advantage where we can actually just write css in a much more friendly way for us the dev experience is a lot easier we don't have to worry about these conflicts happening the way that they're happening right now so what i'm going to do is let's remove this light a from here and I'm going to come up to my light class and I'm actually going to remove this from here as well. I'm going to do at scope and we're going to do dot light. So it's an at rule like media queries and other things. And we put the selector that we're scoping inside of the parentheses right there. Let's make this a little bit bigger so you can see it. Uh, so we get the light like that. And now there's different ways of selecting this specific selector. And one of those ways is a scope pseudo class like this one. So I can do scope. And then I can apply these rules here and you can see that the light styling has come back. So whatever selector is here is basically what's getting put here. Another way you could actually do that is using the ampersand. If you've never used nesting before, the ampersand here is just a placeholder for what's here. We're gonna come back to that in a little bit though, because there is a small difference between using scope like this and using the ampersand, but we'll use the scope for now and I'm gonna set it up like that. And then I'm gonna come here and we had that light A, but I can just make this my A now. And I was just pasting that in from what we had uh, before. And so now I'm saying any link that is scoped inside of my light. 
is going to get the styles. So you can see here, we're getting the dark one, but notice here it's not actually breaking. And then we can do this same thing for all of them. So I'll do that really fast. I'll just update my code. All right, there we go. So I have, you can see the dark, I've done the exact same thing. And then the same thing for my vibrant now as well. And now if I come and look, it's fixed all of those issues that I was having. It's kind of cool, right? Uh, and we're gonna talk about why that works and we're gonna get into much more in depth onto more practical use cases for this than what I've done here. So one of the reasons this has actually worked is we've removed part of that specificity issue that was happening before because we were using a light space A, um, right? And that was boosting the specificity. If we look in our dev tools now, you can actually see we, we have the at scope is showing up here. Uh, let's get the link itself. Um, so I'm just have an A selector. It has a specificity of one the same way anything else would have a specific, right? It's a regular A selector. Um, and it's scoped to my light area that's right here. So anything that's in a light, that's a link, we'll get that. And it's not worried about the styles that are coming from other places. It's saying the nearest scope that we have is our light. So I'm gonna use that style right there. And it's nice because it is in our dev tools. We can sort of compare and still see where things are coming from. And what's really neat with this is the order of things doesn't matter at all anymore. What matters is the scope of things. It's all about proximity rather than the order that our code is written. Again, before we're running into those issues, because the order of things, it was getting to the second one, it matched the specificity, it was breaking things and we were running into issues. And part of that is because the way that scope works is we're introducing a new part to the cascade. And we can actually read that this here, I'll put a link to this and all the code pens and everything are linked in the description. And so here in the cascading sorting order, we have origin of importance, we have our context, uh, we have the style attribute, we have our layers. Uh, you might've seen me talk about layers previously, specificity, uh, order of appearance, that was what was causing the problem, the order of things. We were matching specificity before, but the order, the last one was winning. Uh, but then we have this new one, which is our scope proximity. And it's kind of weird if you read it in the spec. When comparing declarations that appear in style rules with different scoping routes, then the declaration with the fewest generational or sibling element hops between the scoping route and the scoped style rule subject wins. For this purpose, style rules without scoping route are considered to have infinite proximity hops. What? The simple way of looking at this is just this idea of sibling element hops with the scoping root, right? Uh, which it's a really complex way of doing things. This, this spec is often written for uh, the browser engineers rather than us, right? Um, so when we come back to here and we take a look at it, what it's basically doing is we're looking at our scopes. We have a scope of vibrant. So let's say we're here. So it sees this uh, yeah, actually, we'll look at this light here, this light, because we have the link that's inside of there. So because we have the light that's here, it's not looking at the order of appearance. It's looking at, it's going, I'm a link that's inside of my light. And there is a scope of vibrant. I've declared one lower down, but that link is closer to this in the DOM than it is to this. And this is the first time in CSS where like the way the DOM is organized is actually impacting how we style things. And that's super powerful uh, and really, really cool. So the you know there's less hops out, <laughs> right? That link is doing one hop to get to here rather than two hops to get to the vibrant, which is what this is sort of referring to as far as I can understand. Anyway, if anybody wants to correct me on that, please leave a comment and let me know. But yeah, it's doing one hop to get to the light, two hops to get to the vibrant, so it's less hops. <laughs> So the light wins. Whatever the closest ancestor is that has scope, that scope will win, in other words. And just really quickly, uh, I'm also gonna link to this article in the description just because it has, uh, this is by Bramis over on the Chrome for Developers blog. Uh, and the nice thing with this is it sort of just shows us where scope proximity comes into things. So specificity is still important, but if elements do have the same specificity, then the scope proximity comes into play. And then if scope proximity is the same, then the order of appearance comes in. So if you don't use scope, it just skips that step. Specificity goes to there. Uh, but we've introduced this new layer into uh, the, the calculation of how things are figured out. So it is important, the specificity rules will still win. If something has higher specificity, that rule will still override scope proximity. So do take that into account as well. And uh, we can see that really fast here. If we just come here and let's just copy this actually, and we're gonna do this as a, we'll do a BTN, a fun little trick to boost specificity on something is you just put the same selector twice, uh, except I called it button. So we'll write the whole thing out, button, button. Um, so 
uh, if we go and take a look now, we could potentially have broken, there we go, we broke this one, um, just because it's getting the black color because it's a button uh, that is inside of a light. And so the higher specificity on this one is overriding what the color was on that. Whereas if I just do this, uh, if we remove that, we go back to the regular A, it's all the same specificity now, so now scope is winning. So it doesn't mean everything goes out the window, it's really important to understand first it's specificity. If the specificity is equal, then we're going to scope. And I'm saying that a lot because I wanna make sure that everybody's on the same page with that, um, just because that's, I think, one of those foot guns that people could potentially run into with this. And just really fast, if you're looking at that image that we were just looking at before from Bramis, uh, of the cascade and wondering what all of those parts were or if you're not really sure what the impact and implications of all those steps along the way are there's an entire section about the cascade in my course css demystified in that course i revisit the fundamentals like the cascade and i also dive into lesser known things like formatting context to help you build a really strong foundational knowledge of css that you can start using stuff like scope that's not covered in the course this is really brand new and cutting edge but by having that really strong foundation when you come across these new things you you have that foundation there it's really easy to add these new things to your repertoire the link to that is in the description if you're interested uh, but let's get into some more i guess practical things that we can look at uh, and this is one of the ones that i came up with and we're going to play around with this demo a little bit now um, and actually let's just switch this over to like this um, and i have this navigation up here at the top and you can see i have a sort of a buttony link thing here that's really broken um, and if we take a look at why it's broken i just have a regular nav there but on that nav, I added this class of button, button inverse that's giving me sort of some styles that are causing some problems. Let's go take a look at what I did. So I have my primary navigation set up and then here I have my primary navigation A. So I'm styling my links that are inside my primary navigation uh, and styling all of that. And then I just have my button, my button inverse and all of that. And here we're running into those specificity issues because my nav primary navigation A is a higher specificity than my button styles here. So even though I've styled my button to have a different color, it should have a black text. This is higher specificity. This has a color of white, it's winning. And so now it's just really ugly looking. And again, if we see here, we can see the button inverse has a specificity of 010 and my navigation is a 011. So this is overriding that one, it's getting crossed off. And so here I could come in with my at scope and in my, um, parentheses, we're going to do a primary navigation like that. Uh, and then I just can bring in these styles for the different things into here. So a UL that's inside of my primary navigation. And we've reduced the specificity of this to just the UL selector. It's an element selector now, even though it's only going to be styled if it's inside of my primary navigation. Uh, that was the leftover. I was wondering what was going on there, but that was a bit of a leftover that we had. So we can get rid of that. I can do the same thing for my link and that should actually fix my button. Ah, there we go. Uh, much better. We can do the same thing here. Uh, we can get rid of that and I can come in, move my A, hover and my focus visible over and then I don't need to nest my button my button doesn't have to go in there this is a general button class it doesn't get any scope but now all of these styles here they're only coming in with these specific things which is pretty cool uh, there is one other thing that I wanted to mention about specificity because as I said we've we sort of fixed our specificity issue here with descendant selectors which is really cool and I find this makes it a lot easier to write just like you don't have to worry about naming stuff as much anymore, right? The reason we had things like BEM and even, you know, Tailwind sort of came along and is popular because it solves naming in a sense. But now I can call something primary navigation. That's a simple name. That makes sense. I don't have to worry about naming my list or naming my links or doing anything like that. I just put my list in there. I just put my link in there and they're going to work <laughs> and they're just element selectors. And that's just super nice to be able to do that. Except we still have a bit of a problem, uh, even though I've done this, which is the hover state. Uh, and the reason the hover state is an issue is here I'm changing the color of my text, but on this original button here, I wasn't changing it. If we come and take a look at the hover here, I'm only changing the background color of it and nothing else. Uh, or actually it's this one right here. So, um, and again, this is just using nesting with the ampersand. So it's a button inverse hover and button inverse focus visible. I'm just, all we're doing is changing the background. Uh, and because we're changing the background, but not the text color, but it's still, if we come and take a look, it's still a link inside of here. And I don't, you know, I don't really want this to come through and influence the coloring of my link. Ah, we can actually do that with scope as well, because scope says we can, you know, we're scoped to this element, 
but we can actually go from something and tell it where to stop. So I can actually say two and then just do a dot BTN. And just like magic, and I realize my navigation is not responsive, um, it fixes it. Wait, why? What? What's happening there? So we're saying that this scope, and this is where we start getting into like these more powerful things that you could do with like the JavaScript frameworks, right? Because we're uh, we're saying this is scoped. Everything is styled that's inside my primary navigation, but don't go into an element that's a button. Now this might sound like it's gonna stop here and then like it won't style anything else. But if I move this up, it's not styling it, like it's not coming along and styling all of this and then stopping here because you can see my blog is still working right there. And it's and this isn't. So what this means when we do a scope from something to something else is it just means these styles are scoped for my primary navigation, but they will not go into like inside of an element that has a button. So do the primary navigation, style everything in there that matches these rules that I have, unless we've run across a button and these styles will not go inside of that class. And you might be saying, well, I don't, you know, I have other stuff that I might want to throw here. Just to th you can do advanced selectors in here a little bit. We'll see more of those in a second, but we could do something like a with a class. And that means that if it's n an unstyled element, uh, like our regular A's here that don't have classes on them, they're gonna get styled normally, uh, but this one doesn't because that one has a class on it. So it stops at that one. So you can be a lot more generic with this too and build sort of more robust systems. It doesn't have to be a very specific element that you're targeting, which is pretty cool. Next up, as I mentioned, we have some other, and I've set up some examples here uh, of just different ways that you might wanna use it so we don't have to build them all out. Um, but, and I just wanted to show that we have, we can have like different, um, selectors here. So again, we have advanced selectors, selector lists, if you do need to target specific things. Uh, but basically here I'm saying if we have an article, uh, anything that's inside my article, which is everything here that we see, if we have an article, I want it, my images to have a border radius and a box shadow, unless that image is inside of a figure. And just for now, we'll remove that. So we'll keep it nice and simple. And so if I have a figure, it's getting styled, you know, like I want with my figure with my fig caption, it looks a little bit different. Uh, so that could be kind of useful and, and, and awesome right there, I think. Uh, and I have the ampersand there, we're gonna show why, but if you set it up like this, it would work uh, very similarly. Uh, but this, the reason I put the ampersand there was just because I wanted to show the difference between using the ampersand and using scope. So let's bring this back to having multiple things here and using the ampersand. So, and we're gonna go and take a look at my image. And if we come and take a look here and I hover on top of that, it always shows us the specificity. So it's a zero, zero, two. And the reason it's a zero, zero, two is we have our article here and then we have the image here. So we have two element selectors coming in. Uh, if this, just for fun, uh, this will actually break things a little bit because I don't think my article, let's just give this a class <laughs> just so we can use this uh, as a test. Uh, just so we can see what's actually gonna go on here. And I'm gonna change this over to dot test. And we come and take a look now at that image. If I come and take a look, it's now a zero one one because this is a placeholder for the selector. So whatever the specificity of this is, is going to impact what we have here. So here, if I did like a main test, that's gonna boost the specificity once again. If we come and take a look now, it's a zero one two because this again is the placeholder. So it's taking whatever is here, putting it here, and then adding that as part of the specificity. If you use scope, it's going to be different. Uh, if we take a look at what it is now, it's gonna be a zero one one. Wait, why is it different? And that's because scope isn't acting as a placeholder in the same way the ampersand does. So you can use either one of them within scope. The difference is if you use the scope keyword, it's going to act as this, right? This is my scope, but the specificity for it is coming from it just being a pseudo class, the same way hover or focus or other things like that work. And so it's the pseudo element here, which has the same as a class selector plus my image. So I just do think it's important to understand there, just so you, if, again, this is one of those areas where scope can be have a little bit of a foot gun, is if you do still start running into specificity issues, which is why I probably wouldn't do anything. I would just have my image like this, we have my scope, we have my image within that, just to keep things as simple and as flat as possible still, because as we saw earlier, specificity still comes into effect before we get to the scope of things. So just keeping things simple there, I think makes our life a little bit easier. Now, one thing that's really interesting is this scope keyword you can actually use in different places. <laughs> so you could actually have like, say we did this, 
Um, and that's an article that's in my main, but maybe you have in a main and an aside. So say here we, we bring this back to our article. So this is our article, any art article uh, is gonna, any image in an article will get this style, but we could actually say that this is not going to work inside of sides. And we could do that by saying a side scope. And we can use the scope word here, which is kind of interesting. Uh, so if, if we have an article inside of our aside, then the, you know, this style won't work. So we're only saying if it's an article, or we could even say if this is like our main article or something like that. So we come up with a very specific selector here, though that would sort of ruin this scope if we did that, because then it would be looking for a main that's an article that's inside our main that's inside and aside. Um, so you probably wouldn't want to do that, but just saying like you can actually get really advanced with doing different things here might not always be the best idea, but I do think it potentially opens up some interesting things. You could also come here and say scope and then do like a figure or something like that. So you're saying any article and then as long as the we're stopping when we get to a figure that's a direct child within that article. Um, though we don't really need that scope there, but you could use the scope to build into the two, which is kind of weird and kind of interesting at the same time. And there's one last really important thing here, which is that selector scope is not the same as style scope. <laughs> and what I mean by that is if I come in my article here and with my figure, just like this, um, so we're, we're stopping when we get to a figure, I can say that we just have, let's just do our scope, uh, has a color of red. Um, and even though we're scoping this to our article and we shouldn't be going inside of figures, notice how my figure's color has actually changed. Why is that happening? It's scoped, it should be stopping there. But that's because I have never defined the color of this. This is inherited. And because this is inherited, this is still gonna work. We're not preventing inheritance from happening, right? So for all of our typography stuff that regular, that does inherit, I'm not, you know, we haven't changed that rule. So we can, if the article is set to something, those styles potentially can still bleed in. So just really important to also know that while the styles I'm putting in here are only going to be scoped to the articles, if anything is in that article, they can inherit, it will inherit uh, because that's just the color that's in there. So we're scoping our selectors. We're not scoping the styles themselves. So that's really uh, important to know. And if you run into any inheritance issues, you know, it's easy enough to, <laughs> you just come on your figure and then say color black, right? And then you fix it. So it's not like it's this complicated thing. These same ways that we would work before still work when it comes to overriding things like colors and fonts and all of those other things. And now I'm gonna jump over to this last example for now, cause I'm gonna show something that I think some people are gonna absolutely love and other people are gonna absolutely hate. <laughs> I personally think this is really cool. Uh, it makes me think a little bit, like if you've used JavaScript frameworks with scope styles, this is sort of in that alley, but it's kind of interesting because you're doing it directly in the HTML, uh, where you can just drop a style declaration in line with your at scope here. You don't need to say what the scope is. You don't have to do this because it's, and, and put whatever it is, because the scope is going to be whatever element it is nested inside of. And if I do that, <laughs> where I have you know this article with a class of card, it's getting those styles. And then I come down to this one here and it's not getting them. And even let's come here and do class is equal to card. Watch this. Uh, <laughs> it is a card now, but it's still not coming into there because these are scoped to this element that these styles are nested inside of. So I'm giving this, I need the scope here to say that like this element itself that I'm in, and like really, I don't even need this class of card here. Um, it's, it's going this, this element that I'm nested inside of is getting this, my H2 that's inside of this element will get these colors, this is going to work for that, uh, and then it styles the things that are within that element. This I wouldn't want to do a lot if I was just writing vanilla HTML and CSS, but if I was using a JavaScript framework, I know they come with scope styles, but again, we can do different things with that. You might consider doing something like this. It's kind of neat that this works. Um, and I think it's, and if ever you just need like a really unique style on something, this has some advantages uh, over just doing like an inline style, obviously, like, you know, a style equals, which we tend to want to avoid. Uh, let me know what you think about this, actually. I haven't really played around with it in trying to do anything real with it, uh, but I'd love to know what you think about this actually being a thing that we can do, because I think it's kind of neat, uh, but it could also potentially get kind of messy at the same time, unless you're working in a componentized world, but then our JavaScript framework probably has a way of doing this that's native to it. Yeah, let me know what you think uh, on that front. 
but it's pretty neat. <laughs> I don't know. I think that's pretty cool uh, that we can just drop scope styles directly into an element and it will just scope to whatever element it is nested inside of. And of course, as we draw to an end uh, this entire time, you might have been wondering about browser support. And alas, it is not perfect. <laughs> as of the time of recording anyway, we're at 82.13% uh, with all the major browsers supporting it except for Firefox. And I, I don't know where it stands currently with Firefox. Hopefully it comes down the road not too long because there is a problem when it comes to scope which is that it's one of those things that it's it's not ready for prime time right now because if you look at something like say scroll timeline or there's other things that we can do that are really good at using as a progressive enhancement. So with scroll timeline, I can add scroll based animations, but if I go onto a browser that doesn't support them, the animation's not there, but it doesn't break anything on my site. This, if I use a scope rule and the browser doesn't understand it, those styles just won't apply, right? And then it will effectively break things. So do be a little bit careful. We're already at 82%. It's going to creep up really fast. When I wrote the original script for this, which wasn't long, it was like 65 or 70%. So it's, it's going up quickly, which is really nice to see. And again, we're just waiting on Firefox. But as the other browsers continue to improve, uh, it will be something we can probably use in production sooner than you think. And in the meantime, personal projects and other things, I definitely think it's worth exploring and playing around with. But speaking of scroll-driven animations, if you'd like to do it without any JavaScript whatsoever, well then check out this video that is right here for your viewing pleasure. And with that, I would like to thank my enablers of awesome, who are Andrew, Philip, Simon, and Tim, as well as all my other patrons for their monthly support. And of course, until next time, don't forget to make your corner of the internet just a little bit more awesome.